Hello darlings, welcome or welcome back to Caramel Latte Kiss. Got Dave with me again. Today we are at the Coventry Transport Museum, which we're going to, well, we're going to do our usual is this family attraction worth visiting without kids? Um, I think we might be right. Should be cool. So, just left Dave checking in at the box office, but we, here in the foyer they've got this amazing old Jaguar E-Type. Um, for those of you who don't know, Coventry is actually where they make Jaguars. Um, Jaguar Land Rover are based just outside of Cov. Um, so definitely relevant to Coventry history. Motor industry has been huge in Coventry for a very long time. A lot of cars have been made here over the years, hence why the Transport Museum is here. So there should be some interesting stuff to see. <laughs> We're starting in Our Future Moves, which is all about technology developments. Um, and obviously most of us do travel. Today's actually the last day this is here, so unfortunately by the time you see this you won't be able to come check it out yourself. But we're going to show you nonetheless. You can have a look, see what we got. So a lot of this I think is about you know, the idea of what transport might look like in the future. Um, especially obviously a lot of the focus at the moment is about how we can make transport more sustainable. So there's all sorts of potential options for that in here, I think. We've had a hydrogen powered car. Looks a little bit like the smart cars, the shape, doesn't it? Like the, the, f the four fours, whatever they were called. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Oh, this is going to be one of those days where I'm going to be really unhelpful to you in terms of the information I'm giving. We might have to rely on Dave a little bit to tell you about these things. I must admit, don't really understand much about hydrogen power, but this yeah. this car runs on it, which is clever and is better than petrol. Yeah. So that's good. Found a submarine. A human-powered submarine. Ooh, okay. Does that mean that there's a person in it? I know there's room for somebody to like be laid down in there. And it's quite a big hatch, like you've got this release hatch here, look. It tells you where to open it. Oh, maybe. Ooh, if that's what it is, no thank you to that. Normal submarines are freaky enough to me, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh. No tower. Impressive though. Um, yes, a lot of the stuff over this side of this exhibition are student projects from the University of Warwick, which is here in Coventry, despite the name. Um, yeah, well, they go down do a lot of very cool engineering type stuff. Oh, here's a blast from the past for me. This is, well, part of the shell of the Jaguar I Pace, which is Jaguar's all electric vehicle. Um, I talked about it in an earlier vlog very briefly. It was, yes, I mentioned it in when we were looking at the vintage cars at the uh, JQ Festival thing. Um, I actually used to work very briefly for, well, for Jaguar Land Rover's marketing agency, not actually for JLR, but close enough. Um, yeah, the i -Pace is one of the projects that I worked on, <laughs> and I've never actually seen one in real life. Looked at mock-ups many, many times, and the CGs of them, but that's quite weird. This is the closest I come to seeing one for real. <laughs> Strange. Okay, done with the exhibition. We're coming into the museum proper now. A little pan round. So we're starting right at the beginning with bicycles. Although, actually, before bicycles, sewing the sewing machine. Uh, what have sewing machines got to do with transport, I hear you ask? Well, it's because uh, a lot of uh, the industry uh, in Coventry used to be silk and watchmaking, which is pretty cool. Um, and it was one of the sewing machine companies, the Coventry Machinists, who were the first place to build bikes in Coventry. So there you go. I guess some similar tiny moving parts, transferable skills and all that. These are examples of the first ever bicycle. It was called the Hobby Horse. So this one in front of it was the gentleman's hobby horse. And then this one, with the big sort of padding bit at the front, was for ladies. It's sort of strange. So we sort of lie on them? Yeah, so. Like where you'd have yeah, your arms there with the big padding thing on. Also, yeah, you've got the big seat. I mean, the seat looks more comfortable than some of the ones now, I've got to be yeah. honest, particularly on the ladies one. So you just sat a bit, then you've got that. Yeah, big padding thing at the front, and then you just... Sort of lean... Yeah, and then... Lean on to hold the handlebars. Yeah, Ooh. and there's no pedals. You basically, you just... Like, oh, sort of propel like, yourself yeah, along. Yeah, just like, walk along like you do when you... Like, like even nowadays. Yeah. Huh. You see the hobby horse thing still going. This one's actually got a little horse head on the front. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, this bike is the first one, or it's believed to be anyway, with pedals. So unlike the hobby horse, which you kind of propelled along by kicking... That one you actually has to go to pedal on. I, somebody who understands engineering more than me needs to explain to me why early bicycles... I mean, obviously this is slightly extreme examples, but even these, which are 
you're slightly more normal sized. Why are they so tall? Was it just to do with the size of they could make the wheels then? Because I feel like somebody of my height, like I'm five foot four for reference, I would really struggle to get on a bike like this. <laughs> it's so tall. <laughs> How would you get on? Never mind these crazy beasts. Well, that's not even a proper. Yeah, this is a penny farthing. Yeah, there's a penny farthing tricycle here somewhere to look at, apparently. And like, they're just. How? How are you supposed to get on them? I'd imagine in some cases it's more. Um, and look at this weird one simple. at the back, the blue. Look. Oh, wow. It's like a long... It's got one massive wheel yeah, on the side. Yeah, a rotary tricycle. A rotary tricycle. A crazy looking thing. Yeah, rack and pin wow. and steering. Gosh, oh. fair enough. We like the look of this one, this sort of carriagey looking. So you've got a giant wheel behind you. I mean, you'd think a bike is a bike is a bike, surely, but no, we've done some wild things with them over the years, clearly. Look at this. <laughs> What are these? <laughs> this is a style of bike called the Kangaroo Dwarf Safety. Apparently they were quite popular um, as an alternative to the penny farthing. But look at, the, look at this one at the top. So you've got like a huge wheel with the saddle perched precariously on top with the handles right in front. What? <laughs> Who thought this was a great plan? Ugh. So this is uh, like a you know, tricycle sort of thing, which were very popular with fashionable Victorian ladies because there was room for your skirt between the wheels here, which makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a bit later on I can hear the thing going, talking about uh, a suitable dress for cycling, but even before that, cycling was a bit of a thing. Um, a lot of fashionable young ladies did take cycling and loved it because it gave them freedom to go about by themselves basically and without an escort which was not at all the thing and actually for a while a lot of people were very anti the idea of women cycling because it for exactly that reason it was a way for them to go out and do things by themselves and there was a lot of nonsense that went around about how women's bodies weren't suitable for cycling cycling wasn't safe for women a lot of propaganda to stop women from doing it and it was told you know it was going to be all terrible for you but they did it anyway, and um, yeah, it's believed that cycling again, was actually a very important part of the women's suffrage movement because a lot of the women went to meet each other by bike. So there you go. There we are. So there's a little bit of what we were just talking about. In the, yeah, but obviously a lot of women, the dress at the time would have been more this kind of vibe, which is pretty challenging to cycle in. And so a lot of them began to advocate for more sensible styles of dress, the Rational Dress Act, which uh, ended up being something like this. More bloomers so they could cycle safely without getting all in a tangle in your skirt, which makes sense. This car here, which is a Daimler Phaeton, is uh, what well, was made at the very first car factory in the UK, which was here in Coventry. And uh, apparently, according to the, some info we found at the entrance, this is supposedly the oldest surviving car in Britain, which is pretty cool. I'm starting to come into some of the motor car stuff now. Again, a lot of the very first cars were built here in Cov, which is pretty cool. Like, as I say, uh, the automotive industry has been a big deal in Coventry for a very, a very long time. There's some beautiful vintage cars in here. I think some even more beautiful ones to come. I'm quite excited, actually. I mean, despite I said, I'm not... I wouldn't say I was a car person, despite my previous job. Um, however, I do like a vintage car, and it is very cool to see some of the history of this kind of area, too. So, yeah, don't be put off the idea of coming to the Transport Museum if you're not a car person. It is just historically interesting, and there are some very beautiful, beautiful vehicles to look at. Oh, we've got a transport road here, 1910 trip to London. We've got various kinds of transport to choose from. Train, most car, horse and carriage, motorcycle, to see what... Uh, what can get there first? So you've got, they're all ranked by reliability, speed, comfort, etc. Let's see. See what we can do. Can I pick first? I think the bikes are already going. I'm going to pick that one. I think it's still just select stuff early. Let's see. I'm going to go. Uh oh. <laughs> oh dear, they've had an issue. Bike's not going that well. Motorcycle's going pretty well. Motorcycle's off. Horse and carriage bicycle, about the same speed. Motorcar's going again now. Oh, look at that. Reliability. I think I picked correctly. The train, the best way to get there. Slow and steady, but. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Very nice. Well, there you go. 
Public transport, still the best way to go. I mean, these are pretty beautiful, aren't they? This is what I mean about these really gorgeous, gorgeous old cars. I mean, this is stunning. Beautiful. So, you can have a little sneaky peek into part of one of the workshops that they have here. There's quite a lot of space like this, I think, where they restore the cars, preserve them, keep everything in the best condition possible so that they can continue to play them for people to see and enjoy. Very cool. Crossing into the First World War now, where again, yeah, Coventry was a big target during both World Wars, actually, because obviously a lot of manufacturing was happening here. It's definitely interesting to learn more about some of the manufacturing history in Coventry. So now I lived here for a few years and knew some of it, but not that's quite a lot of stuff I've learnt here, in here today, which is cool. Um, like I said, yeah, even if you're not really a car person, I do think this is worth checking out. It's There's a lot more to it than just, here is a car. A lot of stuff about the social history that went into it and why cars was you know how they came to be who would have driven what at what time yeah definitely some really interesting stuff if you're interested in how people lived at different periods in history some interesting info here we've got cars now from kind of the 20s and 30s and some info about that so and this was kind of around the time when cars started to become a little bit more affordable so the average person could have them which also meant demand went up so with the big coventry production companies who make from the cars brought in production lines um, unfortunately, yeah, there's a little bit of info here. This car's slightly blocking it, but basically what it's saying is that the line workers did the same job as the highly skilled coach builders, but they were paid less. Talking about, yeah, and you know, how many people had cars by 1939. They started to bring in road laws. 1935, 30 mile an hour speed limit. It was introduced in towns. <laughs> the driving test was made compulsory. Gosh. Yeah, and then car design started to become more sort of art deco. Yeah, this is the ones I like, the 30s, really kind of sleek, really chic looking cars. Beautiful. Here we go, it's another one of the shell of one of these lovely old kind of 30s made cars. And compare this to the shell of the i we looked at earlier. <laughs> A little different. We just learnt something interesting about this car. Go on, Dave. Yeah, so this is a 1923 Humber Chummy which was presented to the Transport Museum in 1970 by Chrysler UK. It was rebuilt by Humber Apprentices in Coventry itself, which is... So there you go. Yeah. Nice bit of full circle history there. Would have been built here originally, obviously. Amazing. Another nice little local connection. This is an Austin 7 Swallow, uh, the body of which was built by the Swallow Coach Building Company, who were based here in Coventry. Uh, later on, that coach building company changed their name to... I'll give you like five seconds to put a guess down in the comments and then you can come back and check if you're right. They were Jaguar. They became Jaguar. Isn't that cool? Here we go, back on Jaguar. This is the SS Jaguar, which was built by the Swanbrook Coachman Company we were just talking about and was the first car to carry the Jaguar name. We've got a Daimler here with a bit of a royal connection. This is Queen Mary's Daimler. It was uh, yeah, used up until well, the 50s by the royal family. Cool, huh? Uh oh, Second World War time. Yeah, as I was saying earlier, again, Coventry has always been a very important centre for manufacturing. So, yeah, there was a massive attack in Coventry in the Second World War. And Operation Moonlight Sonata. A third of the city's factories were destroyed or damaged.
pretty amazing piece of history here. This is the Victory Car, which was used by Fugelmarsh and Montgomery from June D-Day until the end of the war in Europe. Um, it fell in the sea at one point and he had it salvaged <laughs> because he liked it so much. But yeah, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, <laughs> some of that's actually really sobering, as I say, but this is so much more than just a big gallery full of old cars. Like, there is a lot of really fascinating history in here, and certainly stuff like being able to see the victory car, like it's Davis is saying, he's amazed that that's, it makes sense, it's bought by Humber, so it is, you know, belongs to Coventry, really, but it's amazing that it's here, rather than in, like, you know, the Imperial War Museum or something, incredible, really, but yeah. After that slightly serious moment, we are now moving forward to the 1950s, where obviously there was a lot of rework going on in Coventry, as so much of it had been bombed. Um, and yeah, manufacturing is still a big part of it. The cars still made here, so I think we're going to get into some interesting areas of cars now. Another royal car, this one used by King George. And it had like a folding body on so that the King and Queen could be seen more easily as they were going by. It's beautiful. Getting into my era now that I like most, with the, the 50s. I do like a 50s car. The beautiful old Triumph. Stunning. See what other vintage buttes we can find. <laughs> old post vans, Tom's tank engine going in the background, that's not to do with the display, it's just in there's like a picnic going this stuff. Cool. There go, campers and caravans as well, huge. Aww, look at this beautiful old camper van. Oh, lovely. display of your toy cars. Look how cool this is. There's loads. Wow. See if we can find stuff that Baby Dave owned as a child. <laughs> I think we might be able to. We found one already. He owned this thing in the middle. <laughs> Told ya. Some of these, I said, my granddad used to collect all kinds of model vehicles as well. Some of these I think I recognised from his collection over the years too. Some cool stuff though. I like Tonka truck up here. Nice. There's some cool stuff in this next cabinet though. They've got a lot of like, um, like obviously ones that does most. We've got Thomas up here. We've got some X-Men. And I can't say I remember them driving a bus. Looks like the mystery machine, but there you go. There mm. it is, nonetheless. Bits here. What have we got? Charlie's Angels. <laughs> That's the TARDIS. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah, Parsley. The Lion. Muppets. Yeah. And them all driving Pink Sutton. Oh, my God, yeah. Talks. <laughs> Wonder Woman George. Oh, yes. I didn't notice there. Cool. Moddy, obviously. That's some cute stuff in here, man. Some Disney yeah. stuff. Spectrum car from Captain Scarlet. More Muppets. What have we got down here? Some of the car now. He's excited. Oh my god, Bram! I've just seen up the back there. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. I used to love Bram as a kid. Did anybody else watch Bram? Yeah, it was great. Is it just me who kind of wishes Jagger would still make cars like this? I'd drive one of these. I don't think I'm ever getting Dave out of here. This might have been a mistake. Tell you what, though, it is a much bigger museum than I realised. It is huge in here. I didn't think it was very big. We were like, oh yeah, we'll pop in, sort of, you know, late afternoon, only six cars get around. We've been here nearly two hours already, and we've still got quite a lot to see, I think. <laughs> Maybe sometime. <laughs>
Coventry champions, and the vehicles that have won stuff. And some interesting different cars in here. Your F1 car? Wow, that's pretty cool. quite excited by this next bit so we were in an exhibit now about the land speed record which is basically the fastest car in the world this is thrust 2 which broke the record uh, in 1983 and went over 600 miles an hour as though it's basically we've been dragged on by the jet I mean the size of it it's not so much as a car is it it is a, a plane Whew. it's huge so, this is the Bloodhound, which is the current, can we even say car, <laughs> current thing that wants to do the land speed record. They're hoping to break a thousand miles an hour. It's designed to go faster than that. I think it currently it's actually only got to about 600 and something. Um, the project has stalled due to a lack of funding. And unfortunately, they don't have anywhere to keep the vehicle. So Bloodhound now lives here. Um, temporarily in Coventry Chance Museum, which solves their problem of where to put it until they can get going again on the project, and also means that hopefully they can attract some more funding because people will be interested in it. So that's pretty cool. We could be looking at a bit of history if it does break a thousand miles an hour. And we've got another one that broke the record, and look at the damage that's been done to it. So also because you've got this again, what is basically a jet engine on the side of it. Obviously, when it's gone, <laughs> it's proper bad at the side. Wow, and of course. Exit through the gift shop. These things. The idea behind these e scooters is brilliant. However, I have almost been run over by them so many times in Birmingham City Centre by idiots driving them. We've got a vendetta. Those have been pointing out Matchbox cars he owned for a few minutes now. I think it might be faster to tell me which than me. These he didn't have. <laughs> oh. Fair enough. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of Dave's childhood toys. If you have liked this video, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I found my favourite thing in the gift shop. They have these signs up, obviously, all around the museum for some of the old cars, but yes, please do not touch me. I'm old and fragile. <laughs> I'll take the whole range, thanks.